Okuma Media's Polity Amtabi Madiba, former MK soldier Lutando Diasop, joins me to unpack his memoir titled Out of Quadro From Exile to Exoneration. Mm. Your memoir starts out telling the story of an artist living in apartheid South Africa. So, can you briefly tell us what prompted you to write this memoir? I had to write this story because I found out that quite a, an array of things were happening and uh, I was in the thick of things. And uh, I found that some stories can be best told by me. I start the book by telling my story back in the, the so-called independent state of Transkei and how I got myself into politics. It started when I was uh, interested in getting myself educated. I told you, I had dreams of being an architect. I was so much in love with architecture. But then it so happened that that faculty was only for white people. And so I didn't qualify. So I found myself entering politics gradually until I found myself disillusioned with the bank education and getting more interested in knowing more about politics. And later on, I found that late in 76, the death of Steve Nico, such uh, things like the June 16, unrest and how the students were being killed brutally. Then I thought, no, 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 something must be done. There must be change. And then that's when now I threw myself body and soul into politics. And in 1980, I ultimately joined the ANC in the suit. I'm um, Lutando, talking about how you joined the ANC in 1980 in Lesotho. Can you tell us the reasons why you left your family behind without notifying them that you were going to, into exile? I knew that uh, if I told them, they would discourage me. And uh, at that time, I wasn't feeling any secured being around South Africa. I had uh, made it clear that I was against the system, apartheid system, and more especially the independence of the trans guy. I had drawn my, the line on the sand, and uh, I knew that sooner or later, um, I might be incarcerated and possibly die, because uh, even in trans guy, the trans guy security and the, all that, they were so brutal towards any opponents of uh, the sham independence of Transkei. So it was for my own safety, though of course it was not easy to leave my parents without notifying them. And you underwent military training in Angola in September 1981, and you're also part of those who fought against UNITA in the Eastern Front. Can you briefly tell us about the fight against UNITA? Yes, that fight against UNITA, you know, many of our MP guys have been actually loitering in the camps with nothing to do, always wishing that someday we'd be sent back home to fight the regime. Uh, actually, something that we went out to with the aims of coming back. But then it, it has always been a frustrating situation whereby we find that only few people were sent inside the country. We couldn't understand it. How? Because how can somebody who has never been trained leave the country, escape into exile. And then when he is trained, he is trained, it is now difficult for him to come back to infiltrate the country. We just could not fathom how that could be. But then when this uh, front against the UNITA came, 
it was such a relief. We had been politically trained that uh, our struggle has got that international element. We were fighting imperialism, not only fighting colonialism, but we had this internationalism aspect within the ANC. So we felt that, yes, an enemy of the Angolan people is our enemy. So we will help the Angolan government fight UNITA. Because anyway, UNITA is being supported by the South African government. So now we went there and massive. Happy that, yes, we are doing something. And we are being promised that uh, within three or four months, will be taken inside the country. So we were in that mood that yes, we are now doing something and uh, all for the fight against apartheid, colonialism and defending the gains of the people of Angola, the people who have uh, hosted us and uh, who are continually uh, supporting us materially and otherwise. Though, of course, some of us uh, had uh, the other intention because it was like uh, the South African struggle is on hold. Let us start uh, defending and uh, helping the Angolan revolution. And can you tell us about the destruction of the APC, which led to the death of its driver? Yes, uh, I was also in the thick of things there because uh, it was now when we were withdrawn, actually we enforced our withdrawal from the Eastern Front because we felt that now this war is not our war and uh, we've got our own war which we should be conducting inside the country. But then what happened is that all along as a soldiers in the camps, we had been uh, having these fears, these concerns uh, regarding our organization. And we felt that there should come a time when the, uh, a national conference should be held. But now, all along we have been afraid because of the ANC security department, which was so much uh, heavy handed towards anybody who was had any dissenting voice or anybody was critical. So being there in the camps and not always being armed, we found that, hey, wait, we now have a chance, you know. Here we are, we are armed. We can protect ourselves against the UNC security. And then we can tell the leadership our concerns and then take it from there. So now, there we were at the Vienna camp in Luanda. We were a demanding a national conference so that we, we could look into our problems, our internal problems. We found that our AC was having its own problems. And uh, we felt that we should be participating in solving them. And uh, what better solution than to call for a national conference so that all these problems can be ironed out. And uh, we wanted that the security department be investigated because there was this place called Cuadro, which was shrouded in secrecy and uh, no transparency as to what was happening there, no accountability. You would find some of us being taken in the small hours of the morning. We hear that so-and-so is being taken to Quadro, though of course Quadro is not the real name of the place, but uh, it was uh, an alias because we didn't want to say, hey, we can't take it to, because we were afraid that if you talk about that place, <laughs> So now, uh, coming to the question, oh, here we are now in, in Vienna. We have put our demands, 
that we want a national conference and uh, we are still armed for our own defense. Then on February 12th, I still remember the day that pre-dawn raid by the Angolan forces. They came at around half past five and they, they surrounded the place, but to their surprise, we had heard them coming from afar because they came with tanks and all that. So that rumbling sound, we could hear it in those small hours of the morning. And we immediately evacuated the camp. And when they surrounded the camp, they didn't know that they were themselves surrounded by us. So when they came there, they wanted to find out who were inside. When we find out there was no one inside, but some few still remained there. And one comrade was about to jump over the fence and they saw him, they shot him just then. So these guys came shooting and I was in the trench and they were there some 20 meters away from me. And in this trench, I knew, I knew with four other guys. I knew I was armed with a bazooka and then AK-47. And uh, here is this APC armored personnel carrier in front of us. But it, they are facing that direction because they don't know that we are just right behind them. Then it was becoming light, uh, the sun was rising. And then this driver of the APC opened the aperture of the APC and climbed on top of the APC with his back still on us, facing that direction. But then they were becoming bored because there was no action. Then he started turning and turning and then he saw us right behind them and said, he jumped back inside the APC, opened the side door, and called the commander of that in that section that hey, he he hear this people in the trench. When that commander came, he said we must come out of the trench. He asked them, we can have an, a, a sort of a dialogue with them, but they didn't allow any dialogue. This guy took out the grenade and he was taking out the pin, he was about to throw it into our trench, and then I imagined the grenade landing in our trench, and what would happen after that. It was then that I decided that I am firing that APC, because I, I was relying on the sound, the APC emits once you pull the trigger, and the rocket leaves the, the gun, that it would disturb him and and indeed it disturbed him we couldn't throw the grenade into our trench it fell some five meters away from us and uh, from there i didn't stop i i loaded another rocket after another rocket and uh, in the process the apc was burning and uh, the driver inside the one who had alerted the whole crew died. It's not something that I am proud of, uh, but uh, I was trying to defend us in the trench, and I and I, I am really sorry for what happened. That is what led to my incarceration in Quadro. Though, of course, it, I asked them in, in Quadro. Why am I here? I wanted to hear from them the charges they are leaning against me, but they never gave me any reason. They never told me that it's because of APC, but APC, but because they named me APC in Quadro, it was another way of saying yes, it is because of that APC that you destroyed in Vienna. Can you briefly talk to us about the relationship between the Lutuli detachment and the June 16th detachment? 
the glutulic detachment, of course, is the most uh, advanced detachment in the sense that they were the ones who were practically there in the formation of the MK in condolences. And the um, condolences actually, truly speaking, is what saved the ANC that prolonged the existence of the ANC because after the Sharpeville massacre, the ANC as an political organization didn't know what to do so as to advance the struggle of the liberation of the black people. Because now it was faced with the brutal forces of the, uh, of the army, the police and all that. So there was no other way rather than forming a military wing of the ANC. So forming the MP, the Nutuli Detachment, Nutuli Detachment was formed mostly by people who were politically inclined, politicians actually, Bondate Mandela, the rest. So now, what happened is that at that time when the ANC went underground, it did not have any experiences, but with the help of the SACP, which had been banned prior to the banning of ANC, PNC, and others. So the SACP had the ANC through the formation of NK, working underground, and ultimately help the, the ANC get its MK cadres trained in the communist countries, which the first one was China, but then later on, yeah, when there was, when there was a, a fallout between China and the Soviet Union, the SACP was in favor of the Soviet Union, and so ultimately MK literally uh, detachment cadres trained in Soviet Union. So now, what happened is that these people were so much pro-Soviet, pro-Marxist, Leninist, Leninism, that philosophy, that ideology. And now it so happened that after some time, there was that political lie inside the country. People inside knew nothing about MK. There were no actions, military actions. There was just that lull, political lull, or and no military actions from the side of the MK. And then in 1976, it so happened that the June 16 protest unrest sparked that political enthusiasm and the people now started being more politically inclined. But it was not, it had anything to do with the ANC, but it had, had, had everything to do with the Black Consciousness Movement, which at that time was gaining support among the students and generally among the people who does at the time when it was called Black Power. So now, when these youth left the country out of the need to join the liberatory movements, they didn't have ANC in mind. They just wanted to get armed and come back and fight. So now when they came to exile, most joined the PNC. But because the PNC at the time was not well organized, they shifted to the ANC. There came now the problem of the ideology now. Between those of the June 16, who are more black consciousness movement inclined, and those of the Lutuli detachment who are more Marxist, Leninist inclined ideologically. So somehow there was a clash, though not so much pronounced, but uh, there was the Lutuli detachment regarded the June 16 group as political upstarts. 
that now these guys still need a lot of political training. It was either the Christmas movement or the ANC. So they didn't tolerate any other political ideology. It had to be the ANC. The ANC does not tolerate the PAC. It is a quite a pity because we are all Africans, uh, but politics can be territorial sometimes, fighting for the hearts and minds of the people. And so now, when people come with some black consciousness movement, uh, with that black consciousness, it, it sort of, it's sort of like a challenge to the ANC, which we have now been so much nasty in uh, this ideology of Marxism and Leninism. Talk to us about the truth and reconciliation which forced you and the others to pursue justice to victims whose human rights were violated by the ANC. Yes, the TRC was was actually the ultimate commission that looked into the, the human rights violations, though of course the others prior to it were the ones that were looking to the violations of human rights by the ANC to its members. So coming from exile, we had been asking for a, such a, a, a commission, a commission that is independent and uh, looking into the human rights violations broadly. But now in our case, it was violations of uh, human rights by ANC to its own members. So when it actually commenced, the TRC had already received many reports from other commissions, but the most uh, important one was the report of Mutsonyana Commission, which had uh, exonerated us people who had been incarcerated in Quadro. And, and uh, it was basing itself on the James Stewart Commission, which was formed just after the mutiny that happened in Angola. That James Stewart Commission exonerated us. It said, no, actually, these people are bona fide members of the ANC. They are authentic members, and they all these uh, ways thrown around that we are enemy agents or we do this by the enemy, that commission said there's no such a thing. But it was uh, in that same year that we were incarcerated in Guadalajara and we had to spend another four years and some couple of months. Once the ANC knew that we were not guilty, and what happened is that the, the, the findings of the Change the Commission were held secretly and were only made public after seven years. Then they were given to the Mutsonyana Commission. So the Mutsonyana Commission gave the report to Dr. Mandela, but Dr. Mandela said no now i would like a, another commission which happened to be the trc so we went to all these commissions and uh, fortunately the trc was the last one and uh, the trc of course also exonerated us and said no we are not any agents or whatever. And the ANC had been violating people's human rights, its own members' human rights all along. And even all our tambo was implicated in that report of the TRC. And lastly, Lutando, during the 80s, you assured yourself that there was hope for South Africa once the ANC came into power. 
talking mm-hmm. about a lot of changes, including the country's economic wealth. So do you still feel the same way even today? <laughs> Thanks for the question. Hoping, uh, well, I do not lose hope, but uh, my hope now does not rest with the ANC. It rests with you and me and my aunt and, and all of us uh, ordinary South Africans that we are the ones who can bring about the change that we always wanted. At the time, I, I, I pinned all my hopes on the ANC, but uh, time proved me wrong, and uh, I, uh, I do not want to lose the hope. But I think seeing that the ANC has got a problem of not having the political will to listen to the people of South Africa. I tend to lose hope that it will be the ones who will bring us a better future. Because uh, in the way it is, people now have also lost trust in the ANC. But I think we should not lose hope that we, you and me, are the ones now who should take the baton and uh, try to open a path towards our true democracy. That was Lieutenant Dyer speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about Out of Patrol.